think about it and get on with it. The Seventh Doctor, 1987 to 1996. Mercurial and highly moral, this Doctor would often despair at the cruelty and wastefulness he encountered across the galaxies. On a trip to America in 1999, he was accidentally gunned down by a street gang and taken to hospital, where the procedures taken to try and save him did the reverse and he seemingly died, only to regenerate within the hospital's morgue. Totally the wrong way to kill him. Um, this variant of Sylvester McCoy is a very welcome variant. I really, really like this, but obviously I'm bound to because I, Seventh Doctor is my favourite Doctor. Um, all this basically is is a repaint of the standard Seventh Doctor released with the Imperial Dalek and in the Doctor Dalek 2-pack. Um, and this one is from his final season costume. I think, it, is it season 26? Yes. Um, his season 26 costume. Um, when he becomes more of the Dark Doctor. Um, and this one is released in the Eleven Doctor set with this particular head, which is the one you saw in my Remembrance of the Daleks review, the solemn, serious, uh, solemn hatless head, um, with, which is very, very nicely sculpted. You can see the wrinkles very, very well on the um, face. I'll just cover the light a minute. Um, and it looks more like Sylvester McCoy than the other sculpt, I believe. It looks a lot better. So, the, and they've done an excellent job with his hair, it's like a dark, br dark black, it's like black with um, a brown wash. I've dropped his umbrella, I do apologise. Um, so that's basically the head sculpt. Um, same umbrella, no changes really to the umbrella. The only problem with it, my version of this Seventh Doctor is, his hand is too wide so he can't have the umbrella sort of holding it at the handle to the floor. So I, he has to hold it like this. Um, but obviously the major differences are his new coat and slight modifications to um, other aspects of his costume. The coat is the dark brown that he wears in his final season, uh, which I quite like. I personally prefer the cream colour, but um, everybody has different preferences. Oh, come on, Syl, hold your brolly. Um, the It's very, very nice, darkly painted. Um, they've changed the paint of the... Um, scarf yet again. It's now in a slightly darker red than the cream jacketed silver and it's got the same paisley effect which is very very nice. The tie is now completely blue with bits of red and, br and gold in it even. Um, you can't see it very well. Um, but it is there. It's no, I don't I don't know what to think of that tie. I think they needed to um, maybe change the paint apps a little bit because it doesn't look as good. It looks a bit strange. Uh, the jumper again has seven rows of question marks. It should be six. It's something they're probably never going to get right. And the problem with this is again, as you go down, the question marks get smaller. Um, his handkerchief is slightly is painted in a slightly duller red. Um, and again, details are missing, but that's because of how complicated it is with the rainbow effect and everything, but still, the pattern's still very, very nice. A gold chain, which should really be silver, but I don't think that's going to change. I've again dropped his umbrella. Um, and another thing is the trousers. The trousers are the same as they were on the other figure. Um, 
maybe a bit a slightly different shade of brown to the previous release I'm not sure and his shoes are now painted in matte brown as opposed to a gloss brown which the initial release had um, and the other feature to note which I didn't demonstrate last time is you can just very easily pull his head off and if you so wish um, just pop on the oh come on um, pop on the smiling hatted McCoy head like that so you can display the later season Sylvester McCoy grinning like a lunatic um, but the only thing and the good thing is about this is the hat band is in the right position for this season however the hat band should be the same colour as his handkerchief which should be brown in this season but it isn't it's just the same red so that's basically the seventh thought so not really too much to say it's just a slight difference to the original release um, I know it sounded like I was um, not very fond of this figure with like the inaccuracies but no believe me it's still a very good figure it's very very nice um, and a very, very nice variant future variants we might get the big brown coat that goes over this one who knows hopefully one day we'll see a um, serious solemn head Sylvester McCoy wearing his hat it hasn't happened yet, but we live in hope. Or you could just customise it, chop the head off. Chop the um, top of a head, solemn-headed McCoy off and take the hat off another. And just, there you go. Um, but that's all there is to say about the Seventh Doctor. You can get this version with the TARDIS um, for the Curse of Fenric set, as it was called, the TARDIS set. Um, that comes with the Smiley Head McCoy or the Eleven Doctor set. And you'll get just the standard Seventh Doctor body with this head sculpt as well. So you've got two options for this McCoy. It's a very, very nice variant, um, and one I'm very, very happy to have, along with every other McCoy that they've released. So the next figure to look at is obviously the Eighth Doctor, Paul McGann. I am the Doctor. The Eighth Doctor, 1996. Passionate about life and the beauty of the world about him, this Doctor's love of humanity drove him to fight his old foe, the Master, deep within the heart of his own TARDIS. It remains unclear when, how, or why exactly he regenerated into his ninth body, but he had clearly, clearly done so shortly before meeting Rose Tyler on Earth. Or, if we were to take John Hurt as being between Eccleston and Paul McGann, that's not the case. But we don't know about that yet. We'll have to wait till the day of the Doctor. So, with the Eighth Doctor, I'm not going to say much at all. If you want to know about this figure in detail, check out my Eighth Doctor review. That was episode three, I believe. Yes, yeah, episode three. Um, basically, it's the Eighth Doctor from the TV movie The Enemy Within in his movie costume, dark bottle green coat, um, silver or grey cravat and waistcoat, silver chain, um, grey trousers, shoes that fit perfectly, and dark black, almost bra dark brown, almost black wig. Um, it's an excellent figure, it's an excellent face sculpt to Paul McGann, I'll just show you that. Um, if I can get it to focus. Um, it's very, very good detail. Um, it's one of the few releases we've had of Paul McGann, there's only been two. Um, if you want Paul McGann, you used to just have to get the Eleven Doctors set, but if you want the movie variant, you still have to do that. Um, but the only other variant you can get for McGann is the Children of the Revolution comic strip version that comes packaged with a Dalek, and it's one of the Doctor Dalek 2 packs. And I would have reviewed that one, but I unfortunately don't have that figure at the moment. So um, we'll just have to do with this. If I get it before I do Day of the Doctor, I will definitely put that in this review. Um, but yeah, the two there's only two variants of the same figure, just different paint applications and different colours. Um, only other variant possible is the Dark Eyes variant, a variant I'm still hoping they do one day. But who knows? We've had an, a real time Colin Baker. Maybe we will get a Dark Eyes Eight Doctor one day if the line doesn't stop. Um, comes with a sonic screwdriver in the Eleven Doctor set, completely silver. Should have a red tip, um, but it doesn't. But it still looks very, very nice in silver paint. But other than that, that's the 8th Doctor, not much to say. Like I said, check out my review of the figure if you want to see um, more about the 8th Doctor. So the last figure to look at um, is a figure that I have never done before, a figure that I've never reviewed in any other previous form, and that is 
the villain himself, the Doctor's ultimate nemesis, the Master, as played by Jeffrey Beavers. By all means, please do come out to play, Doctor. I'm waiting for you. Now, before I go into detail of this excellent figure, I'll just show you the articulation very, very briefly. The head can turn very, very slightly. Mine's very loose, so I don't like to do it too much, but you can turn it inside the hood. It's very, very difficult to move. It can go up and down slightly as well. Um, the arms can go about 90 degrees. They can't go too far um, because of the cloak. Is he can't do a 360, oh he can do a 360 in his um, biceps if you're careful and he can go out to the sides as well like that um, his arms bend, he has articulation in the hands and if we just take a peek underneath his cloak his legs can move on a T-joint on a T-joint and can do 360s as well the knees can't really bend even though the articulation is there because of the cloak once again so that's the articulation for the Jeffrey Beavers Master. Not much, but it's okay. He doesn't need to move much as he is supposed to be old and decayed. But the detail on this figure is the real highlight. Now, um, for those of you who may not know, but, if, but there are a large majority of you who will, the Master is on his last regeneration and has decayed to almost a skeletal form in The Deadly Assassin, where he's played by Peter Pratt, which is basically the body of this figure. And he appears again in Keeper of Traken, um, this time played by Jeffrey Beavers. And it's basically the same figure in body with a new head sculpt and a slightly different paint application. Now the detail on this figure is phenomenal. They really have done an excellent job realising Jeffrey Beavers' master. Um, the first thing I'll talk about is the face sculpt. It's the mask as it looked. Let me just move that back. In the Keeper of Traken, it's very, very nice. It's got all sorts of wrinkles and burnt effect on his face. It's painted in a dark green and a um, and some other dark washes on it as well, eyes painted completely white almost like a skeletal um, and his mouth is just basically sculpted teeth with white on them, I've had a slight paint bleed onto the lips but he doesn't really have lips this version um, so that's very very nice um, Obviously in Keeper Traken the face was um, just a normal mask rather than a solid piece as it was in Deadly Assassin. Um, the cloak is the most impressive part of this figure. There's so much detail into it, all the rips and tears and the different bits of fabric that make it up um, is very, very good. It's very thick, as you can hear. Um, there's rips in it at the bottom. It's painted in a dark, it's well, a black wash actually, and the original release for Peter Pratt was in a green with darker washes on it. You've got this tear in this hole here with the smooth um, fat, um, plastic. It's actually quite a chunky piece there. The hood is sculpted very, very nicely as it has the um, different rips and tears and different fabrics yet once again. The hood has also got a gap underneath where his shoulders are. This is because, uh, as it is the Peter Pratt Master, this, original, this figure originally had the sash of Rassilon on it, which was a nightmare to get off. I will show you that in another review. Um, the cloak is open at the bottom, however it can't open too much. You can just see the inside. You can kind of see like a Delgado-esque costume underneath. Um, you didn't really see his costume underneath the cloak much, but it's a nice bit of artistic license. Um, the cloak usually is completely open on the Peter Pratt version, but on the Jeffrey Beavers version it is closed. Um, on here, it's been glued shut, so don't try and pull it too much to see inside. Um, the arms have the um, bit. This is again why I believe the Delgado costume is under here. It's got nice little creases on the arms here and on the cuffs where the elastic is to cover the seams where the glo the um, gloves go on for his hands. The gloves, the hands are very very nice as they are also decayed and dark brown. They've got veins on them, whether you can see or not on camera, I don't know. But that's very, very nice attention to detail as well. So, pretty much that, um, a very, very nice master. I quite like Jeffrey Beavers. I think he's an excellent actor. And he certainly gave a brilliant performance in the light at the end. Um, as it is that incarnation of the master looking like this that is um, menacing the Doctor in that story. Although, strangely, as you can, if I just take the CD, as you can see, he's not decayed on the CD. Why that is, I have no idea. But, as you can see, he's still wearing the cloak. Um, 
and he still looks very very nice indeed so the Jeffrey Reavers Master comes from the Keeper of Chalk and Set if you want that figure you have to buy the Keeper of Chalk and Set it's £40 or it was in Forbidden Planet you can get it on eBay and it comes with two TARDISes and a fourth Doctor with some accessories so or you can get the Peter Pratt Master and you'll get essentially the same figure but with a different face sculpt and different paint taps and the sash of Rassilon so that's the Master, a very very good figure, wonderful to see another Master, um, one I definitely wanted to own, and definitely a figure worth trying to track down. So that's all the figures of this Light at the End review, however we're not done yet, there is one last little thing to look at, what that is you, um, I hinted at previously, um, it's obviously something you can already see. I'll just move the light at the end out of the way for the moment. Um, and without giving too much away, this um, next thing is very, very important to the story. Um, Sylvester McCoy is going to stay because it's his accessory. And that is, um, if I can do it without knocking the display over, um, and that little accessory is the TARDIS. It stands for Time and Relative Dimension in Space. The TARDIS is one of, this TARDIS in particular is one of two classic TARDISes that were initially released. They released a version with the 7th Doctor, which is this one here, and another with a, um, yet another season 12 4th Doctor, which was from the 70s, this one being mainly from the 80s. Um, and this TARDIS can be used with season 18 Tom Baker, Peter Davison, Colin Baker, and Sylvester McCoy, and even Paul McGann. And I love this TARDIS. It's um, my favourite kind of TARDIS out of all of them. Um, I couldn't afford them all, so I thought I'd go with this one. Um, and basically, all the TARDIS bodies are the same sculpt. It's just they have different paint apps and different tweaks and different little features. Um, this is a sound effects TARDIS. They are all sound effects TARDIS. So basically, if we look at the back, you can see the little speaker there, and you just unscrew this panel and put in the batteries, I think it's two double A's, possibly triple A's, and switch it on at the bottom, and if you put the TARDIS down, it will make noises to take off and to land, so um, I don't have batteries in, but in order to do that, I'll just see if I can call on the powers of B, and you get the taking off, you get the taking off sound. for the TARDIS as well. And the other good, cool thing is, um, I'll just tilt it up so you can see it, the lamp also lights up when it takes off and lands as well, which is very, very nice. Um, so the detail is fantastic on this TARDIS. It's painted in the light blue as it was in the 80s. Um, the windows, you have the two frosted windows here. You can't see them very well on camera. Um, and you have the normal windows here and the the rows, the three rows of two on the front. The police public call box sign as it appeared in the 80s that's been painted um, in the black with the white lettering. There is also ones where it's blue um, as well. Um, I believe this box is sort of based on Legopolis. It says it's from um, Sylvester McCoy's era but it also could be from Legopolis, the other police box they used. I think it's the Barry Newbury prop. Um, um, if I'm remembering correctly. There's a lot of detail in the sculpt of this TARDIS as there is a lot of, because it's made of wood um, the outside, what they've done is they've actually put, as you can see, wooden detailing on the TARDIS and then it's painted in the blue and the blue really helps to highlight all the detail on this TARDIS. I can't really do it justice on camera. You have to have it in your hand but as you can see there's all sorts of nice little um, bits on it and it looks very very good and in the light, the blue paint app is very, very impressive indeed. I just love this TARDIS. The only thing I have a little gripe with is the base. Um, I'll just tilt the camera down. Um, it's a bit thick, but that's because all the sound and all the mechanisms and stuff are inside this part of the TARDIS. Um, so it's a bit thick, but all the classic TARDISes have this, and um, possibly the new series TARDISes. I don't have one to hand at the moment. Um, but yeah, it's alright, I don't mind it, um, and anyway, cameras generally like that, so I don't tend to notice. 
Um, the sign is also very, very good. I can't focus it in on this camera, but it's uh, the wording as it is in the 80s. Police telephone free for use of public. Advice and assistance obtainable immediately. Officers and cars respond to agent calls. Pull to open. And there's a little nifty feature. If I just pull to open, it has the telephone inside as seen in Logopolis, which is a brilliant feature. Um, it's the black telephone with the silver thing that the police officer gets before he gets pulled inside. The master star is disguised as a police box and killed. Um, you can, as you've just seen, you can also open the doors. You can't open this one very much because of the box containing the um, phone. But inside, you can see the sound box. It's completely blank on the inside. It's empty. There's no like card or sticker for the insert of the console room. But there wasn't one in the story, so that's good. You can see the windows all the way through on all the sides um, as well, which is very, very good. And not much to say. The only feature of opening the doors is you can put doctors inside and other companions and you can close the door. To close this door, you just use the spring-loaded bit there, like that. And it's all very nice. Um, the front doors have the door handle and keyhole, as it was in the 80s, um, which is very, very good. The roof of this TARDIS is the double stacked roof as it is in the 80s. There is the single stacked roof which is the Tom Baker release. But this is the double stacked which I actually prefer because it makes it look taller. And as you can see it's got the nice point here going towards the lamp. And the square here and it is the circular lamp. I'm not quite sure if that's accurate or not. I believe it is. And that's very very nice. Um, and just to demonstrate, lastly, just to give you an idea, you can take your figure and you're going to, if his umbrella doesn't stop him and fall, you're going to stick a doctor in the TARDIS like that and then you can have him in, use your camera skills and have him take off in the TARDIS ready for adventures in time and, time and space as he's done for the past 50 years with eight different faces. Um, and that pretty much sums up and concludes the review, really. That is all the figures I have to show you from the past 50 years of Doctor Who, in particular the classics. Um, and the lamp of the TARDIS in particular, I think, is a very good little metaphor for the light at the end. And there we are, eight figures, eight Doctors, their all-time adversary and their trusty time machine. All these people who have meant so much to so many people all over the world, keeping us entertained with adventures in time and space for nigh on 50 years. So, that pretty much brings the review, Light at the End, Doctor Who review special to an end. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to buy any of these figures, they are available in various sets. You can get most of the Doctor variants that are shown here in the Eleven Doctor set, mainly the first, second, fourth from the Seeds of Doom, the the fifth, uh, no, not the fifth, the sixth, the seventh Doctor, and the eighth Doctor can all be bought in the Eleven Doctor set. That can be bought from Forbidden Planet or Toys R Us. I'll post the links in the description. You can get the Pyramid of Mars Tom exclusively at Forbidden Planet. You can get this Peter Davison wearing the hat in the Planet of Fire set, that Peter Davison there, with the Master. Um, the real time Colin Baker, you're better off trying to find that on eBay as that is a very, very rare figure and it's not around much. I mean, I had to pay quite a lot of money just to get mine and I can't take it out of the box because it, it's just so rare for an exclusive that I can't justify opening it. Um, the Jeffrey Beaver's Master comes from the Keeper of Trarkin set, so if you want this figure you'll have to buy that, but you'll also get a Season 18 Tom without the jacket, a Malka figure, which is also the Master's TARDIS, and the Clock Master's TARDIS, which is the, the grandfather of the Clock TARDIS that he has in that story. Um, and if you want the TARDIS, you can buy that with Sylvester McCoy, this variant with the hatted head. Um, for about £30 and that's available in Forbidden Planet and also on eBay and perhaps Amazon. So thank you for watching this Light at the End review guys, it's been very enjoyable. Um, if you'd like to know more about these figures, check out Batman March's blog or some of his videos, mainly his Eleven Doctors review. And join me next time in the next Doctor Who 
anniversary special action figure review, which will be the Day of the Doctor, looking at Christopher Eccleston, David Tennant, um, Matt Smith, and a couple of other figures. Um, what they will be, you'll just have to wait and see. So, thank you for watching this review, and I shall see you next time. Come on, Johnny, back to the TARDIS. TARDIS, 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 Come along, Chesterton, Barbara, Susan, back to the ship. Come on, Danny. I think we'd better be going. Come on, Sarah. Time to leave, I think. I think it's time we were going, Lila. Um, yes. Well, let's get back to the TARDIS. This is... Well, then, there's nothing else for it, Perry. We shall just have to... Time to go, Ace. Time to go.